recording in progress. All right. Hello. It is it is episode 3 and it is late. How late is it? It is very late. Yeah, it's late because we're busy and we couldn't get the slides together in time or we wanted to procrastinate to the point where we can get the slides down. You didn't You know what? We're human though and we're here now. You didn't And we're thankful for it. You didn't want to record the name. <laughs> spent a long day at the big no i did not and then now you're waking up at six o'clock then 10 is only eight hours of sleep that's true um and then the thing is you know maybe you should form a union against me if you didn't want to record tonight i'm a one-man army yeah but i'm gonna rig the votes so you'll still lose (laughs) all right three votes from a one vote union Welcome to Calfire Crackpot 3, line 3, tar sands suck. So, now that we kind of covered the basics of climate change and water policy, we're going to start to get down to some specifics. How's that sound? We're in brass tacks now, yeah. That's right. So, today we're taking a field trip to Maple Syrup Hockey, um, acting superior to America land, Canada. Looking... All superior over there with your universal health care. But what is the deal with oil? Oh, shit. Okay, yeah. So what's the deal with oil? You know, pipelines, they transport oil. So what what is oil? Oil is petroleum, which is hydrocarbons. Mm-hmm. How, how do we get hydrocarbons? Does God put hydrocarbons underneath the soil for us to use forever? So God's green earth, okay. many, many years ago, had not so green dead creatures on it those creatures are made of carbon but didn't didn't god create all the humans at the same time so how are there yeah five thousand years ago he oh. also put <laughs> dense supplies of carbons <laughs> below the earth's surface okay that over time have compressed into petroleum and other hydrocarbons so basically oil big flammable thing you light thing world does an industrial revolution which which isn't so good yeah um maybe the industrial revolution and its consequences or were a actually a disaster for the human race this is true um yeah ted kaczynski please watch our podcast straight from his maximum security or, so or listen to it when i eventually put it on apple Podcasts. um so now let's talk about the sources of oil. So as you can see, oil oil comes from land, sea, and Los Angeles. So we have here deep water horizon. So you can see we have oil flowing up into the clouds to be extracted by oil refineries. And these these ships are Greenpeace. They're trying to stop the oil flow. Greenpeace is evil. They don't want the oil in your children's hands. So, and then this one's Piper Alpha in the North Sea. Just Piper Alpha was a particularly bad disaster because a lot of people, it was kind of a, like a 9-11 type incident where as had no choice between jumping into the water or getting... Yeah, killed. as offshore oil rigs go, that's more or less the Challenger incident. Mm-hmm. And then right here we have the Kuwaiti perennials <laughs> of basically just exploded oil tops during the Gulf War. Um, yeah, Iraq did a bit of trolling and exploded all of Kuwaiti's oil wells and basically did this, which if, if they weren't put out would be going for well over 100 years. Oof. Yeah. That's pretty long. Did you see how they put them out? I have not, actually. So they basically put, like, jet engines full of seawater that were just spraying seawater at these things, and then, like, they'd have to get in and, like, shove a big switch over it to turn the oil off. And, like, if some dude, like, even has coughed too hard, all the oil could light up again that everyone was standing in and getting covered with. Oof. That is not good. Oh yeah, it was it was really weird. And then here we have Los Angeles. So this is just someone some dude's backyard um, that there's an oil derrick in. Like the only way to afford living in Los Angeles is to have an oil derrick in your backyard. 
that limo is paid for with oil money. Yeah. Don't it's it. filled to the top with oil. So where where, do, where does oil come from? For the most part, um, it comes from the Middle East, okay. and then it also comes from Venezuela. South America, especially a country that, you know, diversified only into oil and then kind of, you know, imploded on itself. Yeah, that's not good. But also, a surprising amount comes from Canada. And only recently, because tar sands have only been a thing recently, because we'll get into it. The deal with oil is that there isn't much of it left, and tar sands is kind of a last-ditch effort to extract all the oil as possible. So they jumped. Um, you can see down here. It says, Hold on. I'm going to upgrade today. Oh. Yeah. So in 2002, Canada's proven oil reserves stemmed from 5 to 180 billion barrels based on new estimates of oil sands reserves, which we'll get into. So the deal with oil is that there ain't much left. Um, you can see a very special boy, Donnie T, in the corner crying because there isn't much oil. Left. Oh, shit. Oh, fuck. Can you see that? Can I see what? The, it's a Windows update harassing and i cannot see it i've just been pushing it off for like four months and it's getting progressively more angry at me don't worry about it queen it's not in the podcast okay so there ain't much left you know like given current estimates humanity's used about half of the oil in the world and if continuing at its current rate which you know it won't because it's kind of steadily declining um we'll run out in about 50 years so that's food for thought there. Um, but the thing about tar sands in general, and this is a really good photo to show, is that they suck. They're super hard to extract. They're energy intensive as all hell compared to like derricks or um, under like offshore drilling. And it's just not a good way to get oil. But unfortunately, that's like a lot of the easy stuff that's left. Yeah, it's it's an incredibly inefficient, polluting, deforesting way to get oil, and basically. it it basically just leaves whatever land was used for tar sand extraction uninhabitable. Yeah, completely uninhabitable, and it's basically covered with wastewater, like bitumen infused wastewater that you need to give to hipsters. <laughs> Honestly, someone would probably buy it if I said bitumen, if they didn't know what that was. So, is that what the black water is? Is that the stuff that comes in the boxes? Yes, that's right. Boxed water is better, folks. <laughs> so, let's get into how it's made. How is it made? So, I don't know how it's made, but that's how it's extracted. Bitumen in the ground is either mined directly out from the surface or steam is injected which causes it to become pressurized and from that point you can extract it that way that's right and you're basically just pumping water under there so it's fresh water uh usually in inland so central alberta which is you know pretty far away from the ocean so for the most part using fresh water to inject steam with the bitumen and bring it up to the surface where you can pump it out or just dig it out and you know you're basically destroying this water uh from any use for a really really long time just leaving it in giant pools and then you know to get surface mining you basically have to level what was already there so let's talk about the sources of oil in good old hockey land there's a lot of oil in hockey land now um you know 98 percent of that is oil sands though so that's really all you're not really going to have well drilling like you do in texas you're not going to have you know deep water horizons like you do in the gulf you're just going to be mining tar sands and tar sands extraction you can see it's really only been a thing in the last like 20 years or so and it's kind of jumped exponentially yeah so, it's as we've gotten to the point where oil is farther and fewer between, 
you know, we're kind of having to fall back on not as good legs. Yeah. Bring back, make oil extraction great again. Let's see. <laughs> oil Derek's pumping. Anyway. What is an Enbridge? So, Enbridge is very important to Line to be because they operate it. And they're one of the cartoonishly villainy oil companies in the world. Um, they transport 20% of natural gas in the U.S. Uh, they're a big player they, on the scale of, you know, evil fossil fuel corporations. Yeah, they transport a lot of oil and, you know, just where oil goes. So, you know, it's got to go from where it where it's extracted and then the crude oil travels through a pipeline to a refinery and then the refinery makes it into gasoline, diesel. It makes it into, you know, petroleum products. Miley Cyrus albums. Diet Coke. (laughs) Rest. So let's get into the topic of this episode. Finally, line three. So line three is transporting tar sands from Hardesty, Alberta, all the way to Superior, Wisconsin, which is concerningly close to Lake Superior, as we'll get into. But it cuts through Minnesota here, and Minnesota is the big kind of controversy in line three because it's been, the new line three has been built everywhere except Minnesota. And in most yep. of Minnesota. So, it crosses through a portion of the Line 3 Indian Reservation, and for that, people are getting very angry. Yeah, the Line 3 Reservation. It's, it's for Line 3. It's no one else. So, <laughs> we'll get into that, but for now, let's talk about watersheds. I think you did this slide. Yes, I did. So, watersheds are basically large areas of land that drain out all to the same either river stream or floodplain and the great lakes are a great example of them because our areas that we drain to are pretty obvious you know superior michigan erie for us huron and ontario for hockey land and then like um then the mississippi river but additionally this means that if there were any sort of pollutants or contaminants on one of those on one of those watersheds, it is going directly into wherever that watershed drains. And then Superior, Wisconsin's like right here. So it's in the Lake Superior watershed. And then the other one, the other big one, the mighty Mississippi. Oh, yep. by the way. We need to go back because you made a big deal about this. We need to thank Fred A. and Barbara M. Herb Family Foundation because you ordered a poster from them for free. Yeah, this might be the biggest resolution image I've ever seen. It took three minutes for my computer to load it. What? It took such a long time. It come out on. It came out onto my desktop as something like ten thousand by eight thousand. So this goon wanted a free poster because they were giving them out and put Cal Fire Crackpots is a company. So as an organization. He got scared and wanted to sponsor them. It's I'm saying thanks in case they watch. I don't know if Fred A and Barbara M Herb are watching a podcast. Hello Fred. Hello Barbara. Hello intern that sends out the posters and has no idea what Cal Fire Crackpots is. I don't think they care either. Um okay. So then this is the Mississippi River watersheds. Um, It's big. It's a lot. Water from a lot of places ends up in the Mississippi River. Basically, pretty much everything east of the Continental Divide ends up in the Mississippi River. That's pretty simple. Now, we get to the exciting part, which is Enbridge oil spill history. <laughs> so we do a little bit of environmental terrorism. We, it's called we, we do a little bit we, of environmental we terrorism. Do ecosystem altering levels of trolling. So this one's an interesting one. So the reason why Line 3 is such a big deal is primarily because of this incident. So it's called the Line 3 oil spill. It's the largest inland oil spill in the history of the United States, and in which 1.7 million gallons of crude oil uh, spilled from this pipeline in Minnesota. So some, some highlights of this. 
It was it was in a wetland near Grand Rapids. So on the morning of March 3rd, 1991, um a section of the pipeline ruptured on a wetland, and a geyser of pressurized oil was spraying 40 feet into the air, coating trees in the area. Mind you, this pipeline is underground. <laughs> Oof. And then, so, 340,000 gallons of oil spilled into a storm drain and went into the Prairie River, which is a tributary of the Mississippi. Um... But the good part is that the river had sheets of ice on it at the time, it's in the middle of winter, so it didn't really get into the Mississippi. But that's not good. And the funniest part is when operators noticed a massive drop in the line's pressure. <laughs> they um, just raised the pressure. They, they increased the pressure. In and let, they, let it kept, they let it keep going against company policy for another 71 minutes. Yeah, the, the biggest problem about, like, what I've kind of noticed from engineering disasters, by the way, we're taking it for this slide. We're taking a page out of my, one of my favorite podcasts. Well, there's your problem. They do engineering disasters about pretty much everything. They're cool. <laughs> you should listen to them. Um, is that pretty much all of these accidents happen because some low skill worker was not empowered or like basically encouraged not to act unilaterally to stop a disaster that stops profits from flat happening. So, yeah. Like, for example, Piper Alpha was primarily because someone was encouraged not to do an emergency shutoff that would have stopped that fire because it stops the natural gas flow and it takes like forever to start it back up again. The thing is, no matter how well designed it is, no matter how many emergency protocols are in place, there could be some employee who makes minimum wage that's not going to follow them because if they do and if they get repercussions for it it doesn't matter they lost their job yeah that's no good it's a little problematic yeah that's that's really all we got to say about the enbridge oil spill history so you know it was the like extremely expensive and the cleanup went on for well over a decade and all in all, it put a bad taste in the mouth of a lot of residents of Minnesota and much of the country about Enbridge and their lovely line of oil. So, the new route. So, this is the old pipeline. It was already operational and it caused that other oil spill. And then this is the new route. And they want to build the new route because, you know, obviously the bigger pipeline is less likely to have an accident. Um... But if it does, the bigger pipeline obviously is worse. And this is the only difference between the new route and the old route in uh, Missouri. Fucking not Missouri. What's the state called? Minnesota. (laughs) Um, And, you know, you got some problems here. So wild rice lakes, you got a lot of those in central fucking Minnesota. Why do I keep forgetting what the state's called? It's Minnesota. Twin Cities, Thousand Lakes? Is that the state? Isn't it 10,000 lakes? That's a lot of lakes. Lot. I've never been. I don't know. Can you check on that? Because I think it's a lot. A thousand yes, lakes check. really isn't that much of an accomplishment. You know, Somalia probably has a thousand lakes. It has touted the name 10,000 lakes uh-huh. as its tagline since 1950 on state license plates. Although it actually has 14,444 lakes of 10 acres or more. That's, so it's kind of a 100 years war situation. That's, that's less, like, that's less catchy. So anyway, the big problem is, and I couldn't find a good reason why they wanted to build the pipeline directly into this reservation land and yeah. water, like lots of water right here. When they had a route and they already had the land that just goes around it. It seems a little weird not to just build the new one 10 feet away from the old one. Yeah, I couldn't find a good reason for that. And what they want to do with this old pipe is do something called decommissioning, where what they basically do is they get all the oil out of there, they clean it up, and they supposedly seal it. And then they just kind of leave it. (laughs) 
Uh. Yeah, and that, like a lot of a lot of the pipeline like goes through people's backyards or their yard as claimed by eminent domain. So like, it's not that's it's not a good look to have basically a metal and plastic big tube that still probably has a lot of bad chemicals in it. So yeah, that would suck to have a giant tube in your backyard that is useless and you can't get rid of because it's still teeming full of petrochemicals. And the general rule with um, in engineering, in anything in engineering, it, it's this. Everything leaks. Everything. Everything will leak in a way that inhibits operation. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how well you design against it. It will always leak and it will never leak in a way that helps operation. You're going Murphy's Law on me. Everything leaks. That's the, that's the rules. And interestingly, um, this was an interesting one. So the Native Americans have a lot of concerns just to, like besides you know just land use and the concerns for water. Um, so what do we know about pipeline um, employees, the people who work on pipelines? Pipeline employees are probably not going to be paid very much. Oh, no. Au contraire. So the thing about pipeline employees is that they make a whack ton of money. They oh, are we talking like lackeys, like people that are placing yeah. down tubes? Or yeah. are we talking like employees? Like lackeys. They live in like shanty towns along the pipeline. They make a lot of money. Really? It's pretty much pipeline and pipeline people make a lot of money. They're away from their families and it's pretty much all men. Oh, so they are extremely belligerent, and there's been a lot of cases of sex trafficking and prostitution along these routes where the pipeline's being built, and that's a big concern for Native Americans through this area in Leech Lake over here, which is that being in their backyard. It's not a good look. Yeah, and you know Enbridge claims to make their employees take a uh, sex trafficking prevention thing, but I'd wager that it's pretty much akin to the Starbucks diversity training. That's not the best look for your company, that you have to tell your employees to promise not to engage in sex trafficking. Yeah, and like given the history of Line 3 and Enbridge's reputation in general, it's not something that Native Americans want, and in all likelihood, probably going to spill again. It so, will spill. Oh yeah, everything leaks. So, let's talk about line three and climate change. So, right there is, right next to the climate change right here, is lovely, lovely governor uh, Tim Walls. He's the governor of Minnesota. And then here is our very special boy, Justin, kind of looks like Ted Cruz with a mustache, Trudeau. <laughs> So, uh, line three in climate change, not only are you just transporting oil, you're supporting the dying and really inefficient tar sands industry, which in itself is more greenhouse gases, and, you know, the oil going over wild rice beds and polluting water contributes to climate change, and then just oil in general, more infrastructure being used to support something that's, it should be being phased out is the main reason that's got people up in arms about this. And yeah. of course, you know, people getting arrested and mistreated trying to oppose this pipeline. Uh, this was all over the news this summer. Uh, the permits were approved, the final permits uh, and the uh, clean water certification, such as they are, were approved a few weeks ago and construction on the pipeline will likely continue. And the thing about this pipeline is the arguments for them are not entirely without merit. So we have other ways to transport oil besides pipelines. We have trains, we got boats, we got trucks, and all of them have their fair share of accidents. So this one up here is from a disaster called Lac Megantique. Um, another while well, there's your problem episode, and it's basically a freight train carrying crude oil went like 
the train lost power and went like Tokyo drift speed around a poorly maintained curve and basically sprayed tankers full of crude oil into the town, like killing a lot of people, basic it like basically destroying the town, setting fire to the whole thing, polluting all of the water. It was a move the town five miles up the river kind of situation. Ooh. That's not very good. Yeah, like, there were a lot of these tank cars. And then here, you know, sometimes they just catch fire and do this. And then trucks, they're probably the worst. You know, sometimes they just overturn for whatever reason. Yeah, you know, I really hate that I have to say this, but, like, you need to design a better supply chain if sometimes it just catches fire is a natural risk of your business. So... But the thing about thing about oil is that it is, without question, the most common toxic, poisonous thing in the modern era. It it is not conducive to life at all. It is, in every way, a terrible substance. And the best solution is obviously leave it in the ground. But if you must transport it as a way to wean yourself off of it, a pipeline is. One of, one of the best ways, however, you shouldn't be supporting new infrastructure around it. Yeah. That's all I really wanted to... Well, no. I also Got want... something else? Yeah, there's some statistics about this. So, 70% of crude oil is shipped by pipeline in the U.S. And 23% are on tankers and barges. Trucking is 4 and rail is only 3%. Hmm. And the thing is, it was an interesting Forbes article where I got those statistics, is that there's different types of oil, um, you know, there's it's measured by sulfur content and how dense it is. Um, I'm probably explaining it really poorly, but at the end of it, there's different, there's different um, Chips Ahoy flavors, if you will, of oil. And refineries, some, like, refineries are made to handle a certain type, so... A uh, low sulfur refinery can't, it, it just can't, doesn't have the facilities to process high sulfur fuel. And yeah. the thing is, as the number of refineries has shrunk, the refineries that remain are huge. So 25% of um, US refining capacity is found in only 11 refineries. So that means that with every refinery you close, there's still going to be the same varieties of oil. So you need to transport that oil a longer distance so it can get made into usable things. And distance means danger. Yeah, distance just increases the likelihood that you'll have an accident. And in general, the thing that was found is that truck is worse than train is worse than pipeline is worse than boat. And, you know, the thing is, is the further up you go, the accidents decrease. But when the accident happens, it's, it's bad. So like an oil yeah, tanker it's... is bad when when they when they fail as they often do like sometimes they just snap in half. It seems like per the amount of trucks, there's accidents higher than trains, higher than barge, like yeah, yeah, you know, and so on. But then, despite that, if you just tallied up the amount of like barrels of oil that ended up being spilled, one barge is thousands and thousands of trucks. And, you know, the other arguments are obviously, you know, job creation, because a lot of these employees are employed locally in Minnesota, but that's really only until the pipeline's completed. And then once the pipeline's All those completed, jobs are going away the day it, it's done. And then, you know, there's a lot of land that Enbridge is using for this pipeline, so a lot of people say, hey, what about property taxes? Well, Enbridge has, is being investigated for substantial property tax evasion. Um, oh, they're, they're not really paying as much many of those property taxes as they should be paying. Um, and then let's talk about lastly the resistance. <laughs> Will it succeed? Because there is a lot of it. Um, resistance has basically been going on for all of this year. Uh, people are protesting in the Minnesota State Capitol, uh, chaining themselves to equipment where the pipeline's being constructed, hanging out in rivers here, uh, trying to get the people who are manufacturing it to basically just tell them these are the reasons why you should stop uh you shouldn't be supporting this um just just so you 
have some i think it's pretty obvious we are strongly against line three and fossil fuel. oh absolutely they're not cool we're trying to be impartial at least for the first few episodes until it gets fun to get into actual politics uh for the next episode to be on that um but really the main thing is i'm going to say is a pretty good prediction that the pipeline will be constructed it will become operational pretty soon probably before you know by next seat like next summer i bet but like this does set an important precedent in that fossil fuel new fossil fuel infrastructure we will be largely opposed uh the issue was is that line th- by the time line three met significant resistance it had been pretty much all completed like, yeah the time there's not what well, it'd have to be incredibly large amounts of resistance in order to stop a large oil distribution company from using their fully completed distribution line to distribute oil and turn profit this late in the game and you you know their old pipeline will likely be safer in terms of just oil spilled the new pipeline will probably end up spilling less oil it's newer it's got new technology or whatever but at the same time the tar sands industry is unsustainable and will eventually die out as oil demands fall. And it's something that you have to wonder, was it worth building this pipeline that will not be useful in the next couple decades? Yeah, in three decades, the use of tar sands is very strongly questionable. And in, in five in, decades, in, in it's three, assuredly going to be gone. In three decades, we won't be using oil whether we wanted to or not. <laughs> Yeah, if we continue the rate we're using it right now, yeah, we're going to be really hitting a bind. Yeah, well, and the, we are using less oil, or at least decelerating the use of oil. So it is being phased out, but in 30 years, whether humanity has collectively phased it out together, or it's just run out, you know, oil isn't something that's going to need to be transported in this volume for much longer. Yeah. They're making a little bit of a long-term plan for a short-term situation. Yeah, and, you know, this is kind of an interesting thing of, like, who's loaning money to Enbridge and just all these U.S. banks making insane loans to Enbridge. And this is kind of a very... I, I, I don't really like how vague this, um, the, this, the stop the money pipeline thing is. Because, like, yeah, it's saying that, like, oh, it's not, it's not like Citibank is just giving Enbridge all of this money to go and pollute it's yeah, it's not like the so ceos long. of both companies are like posing for a photo op with a giant check for 5.15 billion it, it, it's 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 a loan is what it is but yeah. giving loans to companies that are just not helping <laughs> any problems in the world um is something that is, is hotly contested it's something that you know if you have debates on and people are talking about should banks have a moral obligation to support companies that do good for the world um yes but they won't (laughs) is my opinion banks turn profits they invest in whatever is going to turn the highest profit if that's an evil company so be it yeah it's 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 the freer the market the freer the people isn't isn't that what we tell ourselves oh absolutely that's the hardest cope there is oh yeah (laughs) never heard that one don't worry customers will support their own interests they totally won't be misinterpreted and manipulated one of the last things i wanted to talk about before we call it is who is actually resisting this so obviously you have you know people in minnesota native americans who are talking about this and protesting but when i was in the bay area a few months ago and what i'd seen i biked on the central coast of california in the summer and what I saw from like picket signs and people's lawns and trucks and everything was a lot of resistance against line three. Um, and an oil spill in Minnesota will have absolutely no effect on California. But California, really people who live there have an intrinsic understanding of the value of fresh water and the dangers to pollution and what it's like to not be able to take long showers or what it's like to not be able to water your lawns because of that. And then here in Chicago, I might have seen one picket sign and like maybe one bumper sticker, but like it's not that big of a deal here because you know we got water, we got 
big giant lake of it right next to us. Like, well, what, what do I care? But I mean, not only will an oil spill technically have more direct effect on us than someone in California, it's just, it's not something that a lot of people around here think about. Yeah, a lot of people don't have the mindset of we need to conserve water because we don't. We yeah. are next to the Great Lakes, the largest body of fresh water in the world that isn't frozen. But, you know, if that water isn't potable, we're kind of screwed. Yeah, maybe if it's... Yeah, you can't do the cover yourself in oil memed water. It doesn't work. It's not a meme. It's just bad. Yeah. That was actually a very nice segue into what will be our next episode. Oh, shit. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Intro to Golden State Water Policy, where we will begin to answer the question, is growing food wasting water? <laughs> is growing food wasting water? Is That's a good question. Food, uh, all that and more on the next episode of Cal Fire Crackpots, where we will be talking about the basics of California water policy in the Western U.S. Yeah. We will see you then. We sure will. And hopefully we will be less tired when we're doing this and we'll plan better. Oh. Isn't that right? Yeah, we're moving it earlier. You know it. We are. We definitely are. It is L, It is capital L late. All right. Any shout outs before we go? Shout out to the foundation from earlier. I don't remember the name right now. Oh, we're going to go back. We're going to go back. Put it in reverse, Terry. Um, oh, nope. Um, you passed it. Oh, God. Great Lakes Watershed. There it is. All right. Who, Fred A. and Barbara M. Herb Family Foundation. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Herb. It's, it's been a pleasure. Please, please give us our poster so we can hang it in our definitely existing studio. All right. It's been fun. I will see you all around. Yep. See you around. I want to stay in the, the, the Zoom. Hmm? I said, I want to stay in the Zoom for a second. Let's stop it. Yeah. All right. Bye bye.